Stay hungry, stay foolish. There are plenty of leadership how-to books filled with advice such as just do this to get ahead. Lots of books tell us how to become a better leader, but today's book tells us how to stay successful once you've reached a leadership role. This episode and today's books help aspiring early stage and experienced leaders alike answer a critical question. How will I use my leadership power? Being a good leader doesn't require being a bad person. And if you know what to look out for, you can keep your ego and hubris in check and become and stay a leader who is effective, successful, and good. We welcome author of The Leadership Killer, Reclaiming Humility in an Age of Arrogance. Bill Treasurer, welcome to the show. Aiden, it's my pleasure to be on the Innovation Show. I'm really looking forward to our time together. It's fantastic to have you on the show, Bill. I was reading the introduction and a quote by Olik Ice came to mind. And it goes as follows. The highest mode of corruption is the abuse of power. Now, I'll add to that what you and your co-author, Captain John Havlick, wrote. Every few days, there would be another media story about another corporate, military, or political leader who would put their entire career or reputation at stake by doing something self-sabotaging and unleaderlike. These stories frustrated you immeasurably, Bill, and inspired you to write this book. Yeah, it sure did. You know, to back up even further, John Havlick is Captain John Havlick, and he was a Navy SEAL for almost 30 years. And John was an old friend of mine from college who I hadn't seen in, in about 30 years. And we reconnected at a swimming and diving alumni event. We were both swimmers and divers. He was a great swimmer at West Virginia University, and I was a diver. And so we all, we went our separate ways. And then here we reconvened, uh, you know, like 28 years later at an alumni event. And we connected over the idea of leadership. For one, he had gone off and become a military officer in the Navy SEALs, the highest elite rank of special operations in the military. And I had gone off and written leadership books and devoted my profession to leadership development, which I still do. And so he and I reconnected on the idea of leadership. And we'd send each other articles and text messages about stories that we were reading in the paper. But inevitably, a lot of the stories started to turn sour. There were stories about leaders who had decimated their entire career and reputations by doing really dunderheaded things, or sometimes illegal things, or worse, ethical breaches, sexual harassment charges and such. So he and I got so frustrated and so pissed at this that we just decided we got to write a book because it was all becoming localized back to the idea of self-aggrandizement and ego gratification and arrogance. And so we said, you know, this is the essential problem that these leaders are getting into. And we got to prevent this from happening with as many leaders as we can. Let's write a book. So that was the inspiration for the leadership killer. And I like the approach you guys took to the book rather than a to-do list, which many of these books are you rather wrote a to-don't-do list. <laughs> right. You know, there's a lot of books that uh, on leadership, and I've written some of them, right, that are a little bit on the Pollyannish side, that if you just put these ingredients in, you will mix it up and you will become a leader. Just do this, X, Y, and Z. But John and I knew that it's not as simple as that, that once you get into a leadership role, there are things that you need to not do as well. And as you said in the introduction, you know, the, and actually this was – uh, informed to us, but there's a guy named John Ryan. And John Ryan's the CEO and president of the Center for Creative Leadership. He also was a former vice admiral in the US Navy. In addition to that, he was the superintendent of all the State University of New York schools, campuses, and that's uh, 64 campuses. And John Ryan told us after reading our book, he said, you know, what's unique about this book is this book is not about becoming a leader. It's about staying a leader when you're in that role. And that's what makes this book unique. So it's more of a to don't list than a to do list. Another line you highlighted was from a former CEO of now Honeywell, Jim Bossidy, who said, when people move into more substantial roles, you need to watch out if they grow 
or if they swell, which absolutely nails what you're getting at here. Yeah, isn't that great? I really appreciate that because we knew we were going to get asked the question, how can you tell when an emerging leader, when a new leader is starting to go off the rails? And while John and I would come up with our own answer to that, but Patrick Decker is a CEO of Xylem. It's a water company. It's a billion-dollar water company that we've worked with in the past. And we asked Patrick Decker that question, and he relayed the story of having been mentored by Jim Bossidy at Allied Steel, now Honeywell. And, and he said that when he – and he continues to do this today, Patrick uh, Decker does – that when he moves a person into a new role – in a leadership role, that's what he does. He watches to see, do they grow or do they swell? Meaning, do they grow in terms of their appetite to learn more? Do they get humble and want to listen to the leaders that are out in front of them that they can learn from? Do they ask a lot of questions? Do they invest in self-development to become a better leader? Or do they start to swell with their ego now that they're in a place that's higher up on the hierarchy? Do they dismiss people at lower levels? Do they only kiss up and start to kick down? Do they make it about themselves and not their people? Do they grow or do they swell? I think that's a great differentiation between the leader who's going to become a great leader and a leader who's going to become about themselves. And you list a lot of the toxic behaviors, including one which is rigidity. And you tell us many organizations have fallen prey to what you call leadership rigor mortis. And the idea is that with leadership rigor mortis, that we become sort of fossilized in our thinking, or we start to believe our own marketing material and that you know we're so good that we don't actually need to improve. Mental rigidity, when you can't look at innovation because you think that you have it all figured out and you've got the smartest people. Uh, and we see this even in entire, not just in entire organizations, right? But we see it in entire industries can become fossilized. You know, just think the taxi cab industry was practically wiped out by Uber. You take Uber or Lyft or whatever your country's preferred method is, they own no vehicles, right? And yet they practically wiped out the taxi cab industry. The VCR, movie rental business with blockbuster videos, was wiped out by Netflix. So it's this mental rigidity, the feeling that we got it going on. You can't tell us how to do business. The lack of innovation, that rigidity can, can decimate it, not just a company, but a whole industry. Yeah, and one of the big factors here is success. And success can breed complacency, which is what happens to so many leaders. And, you know, we a few weeks ago, we had on the former CEO and chairman of a business called Cree, Chuck Swoboda. And he was talking about how he went from an innovation role into the business to being CEO. And when that happened, he himself changed his game plan. His game plan became one of not winning, but rather one of not losing. And this is what happens when you have success, you start trying to protect that success. You know, that's a keen insight, right? Are you playing to win or are you playing not to lose? I think that a certain degree of desperation is healthy for a business. It keeps you hungry. But when you've had a number of a string of successes over and over, you can start to believe your own marketing hype. I'll, I'll give you a personal example from my own life. I was a springboard diver. That was my uh, college uh, sport. And, and I can remember I won the three-meter diving championships for the East Coast. I, was the, I won the title. I became the best diver on the East Coast on the three-meter. That's the high board. And I remember the Monday after I won the Eastern three-meter diving championship, and I went into practice that Monday, and man, I strode on that deck like a peacock. Here I was. I could carry the title. I was the, the beast of the East. I was the one who was the greatest diver on the East Coast for the high board. And I went up on the high board that Monday, and I went up in the air, and, and there was a whole pool deck of swimmers and divers watching me because, hey, here's the guy who won the championship. And I go up to do a simple reverse dive, and I got lost in the air, and I was like an upside-down stink bug flailing my arms and legs and landed smack on the top of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's like a karmic boomerang. There's something about when your ego gets too large, the universe wants to give you a lesson really quick. And that simple example in my own life happens to companies too. When we get so cocky and we start to believe our own success and we start to take an air of arrogance, there's, it's almost inevitable that there's going to be a 
universal reverberation to right size your ego. Yeah, and many of us feel, you know, people in leadership positions or perhaps people in successful positions that the universe may let them away with it. But you call this out that you really don't think so. And I agree with you here, man. I don't think people get away with it. And they may have financial success. They may have what appears to be success on the outside. But ultimately, the universe or that karmic boomerang catches up with them. I think so, right? And it may not be, it may be in the long arc of the story. It may not be in the short term. It might be in the long term. Uh, if you mistreat people as your way of getting to the top, right? And we call it kissing up and kicking down. And then you get up there and now you have a bunch of wreckage on your way to the top and on the way to the leadership role. You're going to have no loyalty underneath you. And at some point when you need that loyalty, all the arrows are going to come out of the quivers and be directed right to your back because you've not built any loyalty on your way up the chain. I mean, the worst case scenario is that you may not find out in the short term but there's going to be a lot less people at your funeral. <laughs> you just won't see it. Or there'll be a lot less people at your retirement party. One of the things those type of leaders use, one of the arrows in their own quiver that they use is fear. And, you know, we talk a lot about on the show about psychological safety. We had the mother of that term, Amy Edmondson, on the show just before Christmas. And it was a fantastic show. But she talked about how essential psychological safety is for innovation to thrive within businesses. But unfortunately, many leaders that you're talking about, they're using fear as a weapon and getting people to do things based on their status rather than bringing them on the journey with them. You and I are in the same profession. We're both in leadership development. And you've, se you've seen it with leaders that you've interacted with or even along your own path when you've been led by other people. There are some people that still use fear and anxiety as the primary means of motivating people to get it done. You can, you can hear it in their language. I mean, how many times have you been to a conference or a big town hall meeting and some self-important leader gets up there and sort of coughs his breath a little bit and says, <clears throat> you know, what uh, keeps me awake at night is, what keeps me awake at night is the technological infrastructure is not scaling quick enough. What keeps me awake at night is that we're not on onboarding people quick enough here. What keeps me awake at night is that the competitive environment is furious. What keeps me awake at night, I, I never sleep at night because I'm awake all night. And if, <laughs> you know, and if you just get a awake like me, if you can just not sleep too, if you can just be as afraid of this business as I am, then I can rest assured that you get it and that you're conscientious. So let me in inject you with fear and anxiety. I mean, many, if not most leaders still use fear and anxiety as a primary means of motivating people to get things done. But people don't care. <laughs> the average rank and file worker doesn't care about what keeps you awake at night. They want to know what gets you up in the morning. And yet, you know, so many leaders still use fear. I, 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 one of the greatest, almost archetypal figures in movie lore, one of my favorites, is Miranda Priestly in The Devil Wears Prada. Yeah. Right? She's like this fear-inspiring witch. And, but the thing is that that fear, for one, it's her own anxiety that's getting transmitted to people. It's her own feelings of fear that are getting transmitted to she is literally in fearing people instead of encouraging people and and the people that are around her become suck ups and sycophants all because they are afraid of the wrath of Miranda Priestly but she's such a great archetypal figure because we can all see the reflection in poor fear inspiring leaders that we've worked with in the past in that archetypal figure. We recognize Miranda Priestly in the bad leaders that we've worked with before. But the challenge is, Aiden, that a leader who's a fear based leader, they lack loyalty underneath them. You, you know, Amy Edmondson, as you pointed out, right, she talks about uh, psychological safety. It's such a great contribution. Uh, to organizational development because the, we think of a leader's most primary role is to provide physical safety for people. They need to give them a safe work environment where they're going to come home at the end of the day with all of their body parts intact. But we also need to, as leaders, create psychological safety where people are willing to take interpersonal risks and feel obliged to tell the leader when they 
are being less than the leader that they're supposed to be. So psychological safety is supremely important. But if you have a fear-based leader, it's really hard to get to that place. When you have that fear-based leader, they surround themselves, as you said, with yes men. And you talk about how followers build the pedestals leaders sit upon and how that makes leaders feel special. And this specialness is even more prominent in family businesses where status is based more on bloodlines than competency. This is something that is really damaging to the progress of a business and particularly to innovation. Yeah. Now, let me say in all fairness, I work with a lot of family businesses and a lot of family business owners, and they are extremely decent people. I mean, I love working with family businesses because they don't have the same histrionics that a publicly traded company that is beholden to Wall Street with co- quarterly financials, uh, they don't they don't have that same sort of whiplash that uh, the the quarterly reports require a lot of leaders to uh, you know be beholden to. So I really enjoy working with family businesses, and they get a tremendous amount of loyalty. But the big downside in a family owned business is nepotism. It, it happens all the time. Uh, and I'm sure you've worked with family-owned businesses and see this. The challenge with nepotism is a lot of times people that are part of the bloodline, people that are the sons and daughters, get a gimme. They, this is the silver spoon, right? They get a pass. And so people coddle them and don't treat them as uh, – they don't give them the same tough love on their way up the ladder. And it chips them later on because a lot of times they're they're getting into roles where they don't have the competency; they simply have the last name. And other people look at that and you know don't respect that leader sometimes when that happens. Now I, it can happen if that leader, part of the bloodline, goes the extra mile, works extra hard, gets in the trenches, and rolls up their sleeve and earns their way to the top as everybody else would, then they gain the respect of people. But it's so easy to not do it uh, that a lot of people bypass that essential part of progression and growth. And we're going to talk about this. We're not going to just have a moan about the, the bad sides of leadership because you give a full recipe for how to become a better leader. This is just things we need to be aware of. And oftentimes, that's the problem. So many leaders actually have great intentions, but the impact they have is quite negative. Oh, definitely. No leader starts out thinking, I'm going to be a bad leader and make sure I mistreat people. You know, like we don't start with that place or a leader doesn't start out thinking, I'm going to become a leader so that I can have everything for myself. But leadership itself is so seductive because when you're in a leadership role, people start to treat you differently. They start to defer to your judgment Typically, you get more perks. A lot of times, you have a bigger salary than the other people that are around the table when you're in the leadership role. So people start treating you that you're special, and it's easy to start to become seduced by that feeling of specialness. And now your decisions are made to start protecting what you've gained. And that's when it becomes dangerous because that's when leadership is no longer about the people being led. It's about the leader, him or herself. And that's the arrogance. That is the hubris of leadership that that all leaders need to be on guard against. You know, we wrote this book and there was some notable omissions that we didn't put in the book. You know, a lot lot of people would be like, yeah, what about that world stage leader? You know, (laughs) you know, it's in there and and people have opinions about this. I do too. But John and I were really careful. We didn't want the book to become about a person. And then it becomes everybody's excuse to say, well, look at that leader. See, that's them. They are, they're able to get away with it. John and I wanted to make sure that people would point the finger, not outward, but at some point start looking at themselves. John and I will readily admit when we wrote this book that we have suffered our own hubristic tendencies, right? Like we have made our own mistakes. As you know, Aiden, you you read the book. You know, the whole book hinges on a story about John mm-hmm. getting kicked out of the seals and having to claw his way back. But that humiliating event was partly a result of his own hubris. And he and by admitting that and showcasing his own vulnerability, we hope that the reader will be much more willing to evaluate themselves instead of pointing the finger outward at some prominent leader on the world stage. 
We better share that story now that, that you've teed it off there. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, ch- you know, let me reiterate you. John Havlick, Captain John Havlick, now retired Navy, uh, he was a SEAL officer, right? So he commanded all SEAL teams at one point in time, in, including the most clandestine group of them all, what's called Dev Group. Now, I can tell you that Dev Group is SEAL Team 6, but John would not tell you that. Um, and, but he's you know, commanded all SEAL teams. So this is a guy that, you know, you and I would look up to and, and yet his own arrogance uh, comes into play in the book in that he didn't watch his flank. He assumed that he would just keep getting steadily promoted up the ranks. Um, and he comes into, and he didn't play politics. So you got, you have big Navy and then you got small, innovative, clandestine navy which is the seals and he could operate in the seal environment but the seal environment has the big umbrella of big navy right and that required a certain political astuteness and a willingness to play political games and john just wasn't willing to do that as this sort of maverick seal so he just assumed that his path was set out for him but at some point he got a bad review uh, and he didn't get, and then then he didn't get promoted to the next level, and he washed out. He was now out of the seals. He couldn't believe it, and he had to eat crow. And this is the thing. I actually wrote a, bo- a book about this, Aid. And it's, it, am I allowed to say a, a three letter swear word on your show? Oh yeah, my girlfriend. <laughs> so I wrote a book called A Leadership Kick in the Ass, and it's these ass kick moments when you get humbled. Uh, It's through humiliation that the entry point of humility can come. Now, John had this humiliating event. Here he was, a Navy SEAL for like 13 years, and now he is kicked out of the SEALs. This is his own identity. This is all he knows is how to be a SEAL. So he had to decide, what am I going to do about this? And he like claws himself. You, You read the story, but he claws his way back by eating humble pie. He volunteers. He drives nine hours every weekend to go from Tennessee to the border to, uh, I think he's going to Virginia, and he's working with SEALs for free. Uh, Then he continues to uh, go to different SEAL events, right? He eventually finds out that there was a mistake made on his documentation when they didn't give him a promotion, and he contests it. And so they tell him, all right, John, we're going we're gonna to think about bringing you back to the SEALs, but we're going to keep you coming in at the level you are, and you have to now spend two years of the command of the naval station in North Dakota. <laughs> North Dakota is a place in this country. Fargo. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a movie about it. <laughs> exactly. You know, so there's there's not a lot of naval presence in, in uh, you know, North Dakota, but he does. He goes to Fargo. Of course, there's not a great Navy up there, but there is a naval presence in any state in the United States, and there's no there's no ocean there, but he go, goes up there, and uh, and he will tell you it was great learning for him, right? And, and salt of the earth people that he worked around, committed uh, officers, committed enlisted people. And it was his way of being banished for two years as a sacrifice that he would have to pay for the Navy to see how genuinely are you committed. And as a result of that, they put him in and they ultimately gave him a promotion and he became a captain. But it's a great story about having to eat humble pie. And his big mistake that he will confess is that he, up until that point, hadn't paid enough to Navy politics and the importance of understanding the political system that Big Navy was. Yeah, and I think that's a templated story that I see time and time again. I'm sure you do too, Bill. You, you experienced it yourself with your own diving. I am, come from a sporting background, and the great, great players that I ever played with or played in the presence of all went through some type of hardship mid-career. So they, they may have started off as superstars, but then something happened, some setback, that they overcame and it was almost in the overcoming that yeah. they were humbled and became totally new people it's a rebirth stage it so is you see this it, you certainly see it in sports there's a new documentary out right now that tells the story of michael jordan and one of the dream seasons of his career ascension i have not even seen the documentary yet 
But I'm sure that there is a moment in that dream season where there's some decimation, right? Certainly in his career, there were. And if you at the look at the bio of anybody, look at the biography of any leader you admire, and I guarantee whether it's Winston Churchill or Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan or Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, if you look at the great stories of people you admire, there is bound to be the valley experience where they have some sort of humiliating event, but that's where the lessons happen. Those butt kick moments through humiliation, you can learn humility. And humility is the antidote to hubris. Our book is about hubris. And if you allow your hubris to take over, it is a natural consequence of hubris that you will have some sort of reverberation in the form of a consequence, a punishment, a decimation. But it becomes essential to the development of your own humility where you start to recognize, I need to be able to look the other person who I am leading. I might be their leader, but I have to look at them eyeball to eyeball and not dismiss them and not to think that I'm better than them simply because my nameplate says leader. In fact, I need to serve the people that I am leading. That's really the great message of the book is that humility matters more than hubris. Humility and confidence can go together. And I love the Italian saying you mentioned in the book, at the end of the day, the king and the pawn go back in the same box. I love that. And it's a brilliant saying. But there's a great saying that I live by, Bill, and it's again a sporting one, that when you point the finger, there are three pointing back at yourself. Because oftentimes when we look at leaders, we can point the finger and go, they're not doing a great job, et cetera, et cetera. But you make us realize that there's a potential for the leadership killer in all of us. And I'd love here if you'd share the fantastic Cherokee story. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. And I like the, uh, you're right, that, right. Like I got a finger pointed at you, the three pointed back at me. And it would be better to look at the leader and instead of indicting them with our finger, to look at them and say, but for the grace of God, there go I, because I've got that potential too. So there's a, a story here. I live in Asheville, North Carolina. In fact, that's where I'm speaking to you from today. And I live about 45 minutes from Cherokee. North Carolina. And Cherokee is where the largest population of Cherokee Indians uh, east of the Mississippi reside. So it's a huge, in fact, there's a Cherokee reservation and it's literally called Cherokee, North Carolina. There is a great old Cherokee story and it goes like this. There is a Cherokee elder, a great grandfather chief, and he is speaking to his grandson. And he says, grandson, there is a great war going on inside of me, a great war. There is a dark wolf. It's competitive. It wants to dominate. It wants its way. It's selfish. This is a hungry wolf and it exists inside of me. It has an insatiable appetite to acquire and to get things for itself. And then he says, but there's this other wolf inside of me, the light wolf. The light wolf is full of compassion for the other wolves. It wants to take part of what it has and give. It wants to nurture and care for the other wolves and bring the best out in them. The light wolf is the best reflection of my goodness. I have both of these wolves inside of me and they're warring together. And he says, this great war is going on in everyone in humanity. And then he takes his fingers and he says, and this war is going inside of you too. And the little kid is startled and amazed. And he looks at his grandfather and says, grandfather, which wolf will win? And he says, the one you feed points to his head and he points to his heart. I love that story because it really is the essence of humanity that we do have our lighter nature. We do have our compassionate nature. We do have the nature of us that is focused on doing right by others. This is the best reflection of what a leader should aspire to be. But we all have the tendency for selfishness. We all have a need to control. Many of us have a need to dominate. We want an a, what power tastes like when we get power. We all have the dark wolf and the light wolf inside of us, and they're both vying for our attention. I love the story of the two wolves because it's really the story of humanity. How do we 
allow ourselves to not be drawn down to our base nature? And how do we allow ourselves to follow the better impulses of our better angels? It's a lovely story. And you also mentioned that psychologist Carl Jung talked about this. And for those who studied Jung, he talked about embracing the shadow. So the shadow that's deep inside of us. And it's essentially that story. But you quote him and you say, Jung said, there is no coming into consciousness without pain. And here you're talking about the work to self-evaluate is not easy. So it's not easy to consistently sit on that wolf, make sure that you feed it a little bit the darker nature, but you don't let it get out of control. And staying on that idea of duality and managing our inner wolves, there's an exercise you recommend we do to encounter these wolves and also to control them and understand them. I'd love if you'd share this with our audience. Sure. And this is actually a tip that Captain Havlick puts in the coaching session. As you know, at the end of every chapter, there's a coach's tip that comes from Captain Havlick. And what he says is, you shouldn't deny the nature of your dark wolf, and you shouldn't deify the nature of your light wolf. You need to accommodate both because they're both inside of you and both need to be fed. So it's not that you want to starve either nature. You need to give expression for both one, but healthy expressions for both of the wolves. And what he suggests is to take a piece of paper and write, how would you name the wolf? If you were to give it a name, put that at the top of a column. And then on the other column, put the name of the dark wolf, right? So you've got the names of the two wolves. And then put, what are the positive attributes of both wolves? You know, it's healthy to be competitive, really any any biological creature is competitive. We have to compete for food. We have to compete for the propagation of the species. So, you know, co competition is good. In fact, it's even fun up until a point. So that is a healthy attribute of the dark wolf is competition. Control is something that we actually need to do to stay organized, to stay out in front of the future, to be a visionary. You have to have a certain degree of a controlling nature, but beyond a certain point, it starts to cast a shadow. So put down the positive attributes of both the dark wolf and the light wolf, and then do the opposite. When you take the positive attribute and it crosses past a certain threshold, what is the shadow that each one, whether it's the positive attribute taken too far or the negative attribute taken too far, what is the shadow that the light and dark wolf casts. So it's a useful exercise because it's important, Aiden, not to cast out your dark wolf. This idea of these tensions that exist in everything in life, I mean, they're throughout every aspect of life, even innovation, the tension between leadership and management, between search mode and execution mode, this idea of duality is everywhere. But let's jump on to, if you're a leader, that it's not easy being a leader either, and we need to be aware of this. And you point out three points of pressure, the three ors, you call them, responsibility, results, and role. A leader has responsibilities, there's no doubt, and you have to get things done. At the same time, to be conscious that your major responsibility is to create psychological safety and to pull out the leader that's in the other person to activate their leadership sense. Having said that, when you're in a leadership role and you're carrying the responsibility, sometimes the responsibility can feel like a burden and it can weigh you down and it feels over obliging. And then you start to carry the burden of leadership. Um, but it's healthy to make the mental shift that it's not just a burden, it's a privilege. When you can impact somebody's life and career through your own leadership in a sustainable and enduring way, and you help activate the leader in them, that is like the whole jazz of what great leadership is. It's so fulfilling and rewarding. The second one, the second R is the results. You know, it, to me, it comes down to means and ends. And a lot of very dominant leaders fixate on the result. Now, a leader needs to get result because get results because you are judged ultimately by you know the problems that you solve and the opportunities that you create and the litany of other leaders that you're able to um, inspire. That said, a lot of leaders get so fixated on getting results that it's like the old story of the goose with the golden egg. It's like, hey, 
give me a golden egg. I need production. Production, give me another golden egg. Wait a minute. Yesterday, you gave me two golden eggs, and you didn't do that fast enough. I think that today I'm going to punish you. I want three golden eggs out of you. I need another golden egg. Give me a golden egg. After a while, I get so upset that I take my knife and I open you up because I want to get all your golden eggs, and then I kill the goose, right? The, the old Aesop fable of the goose with the golden egg. We get so fixated on production that we lose sight of the fact that production is a function of how do we treat the goose? How do we feed the goose? How do we nurture the goose? How do we develop the goose so that they get better skills and give us higher quality golden eggs over time? So this tension between production and the means to production. Production, the result is the ends, but the treatment of people is the ensuring of a better ends. But so many leaders get so focused on result, 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 and don't fe- feature or don't um, fixate enough on the means. And that is, how am I doing right by my people? Am I developing them? I am I'm increasing their capabilities? Or am I helping them add more value to the organization? Am I doing right by them? Am I being loyal to them? Am I supporting them in their absence? That's what's going to get you better golden eggs. And Aiden, the third R is a person's role. And when a person's in the leadership role, sometimes we get a little adhesed to that role, right? I am the leader. I am. Look at the medals on my chest that say leader. You will treat me with respect because I am the leader. Sometimes we get so adhesed to the role that we forget the humanity behind the role. And we feel like we're in this, like a performance, that I'm in a role that I'm having to portray a leader versus actually be a leader. And this is where leaderships can some st- uh, sometimes start to lose a sense of authenticity, is that we're so worried about projecting that I am the one in charge and putting on a play for people that we start to become, you know, start to smell a little bit insincere to the people around us. So it's okay to be in a role and it's okay to assume the role and even portray the role, but it's not okay to get so adhesed to the role that you forget about your own humanity when you're looking in the eyes of the people that you are privileged to lead. When you mentioned role, it made me think of the term persona. I think it was Jung again who came up with this, which stems from the Greek word from mask. And leaders have to wear a plethora of masks to the board, to peers, to shareholders, and to stakeholders and to customers. But one thing you highlighted was the serious challenges where leaders get better results from some people if they treat them as equals but others will lose respect for the leader if they treat them as equals. And these are the challenges and the dilemmas and the tensions that leaders have to deal with all the time. Yeah. I had a VP. He's now an EVP. One time we were talking over lunch and we were just you know, discussing about leadership is really hard. And I said, well, why do you think it's really hard? The guy's name was Tim. And Tim said, well, you know, Bill, it's, it's all different. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, this guy over here, I've got to be as authentic as, as I can be. I got to take my mask off. And this guy over here, I've got to be the one in charge and I've got to be a disciplinarian. And this one over here needs me to be, uh, you know, sort of nurturing and compassionate and coach like. And guess what? When I take my mask off, I might not be any of those. I might be entirely different, but for each person, they need me to be somebody else. So I got to come to work each day prepared to be versatile for each person based on their needs. And I thought that was really so insightful that leadership, this is what makes leadership the the art of leadership, right, is is the recognition that I have my own self and my own gifts and contribution and natural inclinations and my own temptations, whether it be the good wolf or the dark wolf. And I've got people with different needs and they're their own idiosyncratic nature that I have to attend to at the same time. Leadership is dang hard. There's no doubt about it. One of the huge challenges you mentioned is the work-life balance challenge, where great leaders often neglect and sacrifice so much in their own personal lives. Oh, yeah. there's a, a and, and I provide a lot of statistics in the book about CEOs and stress-related illnesses. Uh, it, it's something like literally 100% of CEOs have at least some stress-related malady. It might just be a bad back. It might have been that they've experienced ulcers in the past. Uh, but there's a you know a high percentage of leaders that well definitely 100 percent of of leaders go through a stress-related malady. But many others uh, have poor health in terms of lack of sleep. They may have had a heart ailment. A lot of them have a high percentage of heart ailments. So it's a pretty stressful burden 
And a lot of it becomes, you know, we don't see that. We just, we just think that the leaders are playing golf and look how easy and cushy their life is. They've got the Mercedes and the BMW and they've got a big house. But in reality, a lot of senior executives work harder and longer than the other people in the workforce. And it comes with its own, not just burden of responsibility, but the sacrifice, or, or I would say the dedication often takes an, a, a toll. It takes a toll on their physical well-being. So we talked about balances between those wolves, for example, the duality of the, the dark and the light wolf. But one of the other balances leaders need to embrace is the idea of confidence and overconfidence. Yeah. We look at leaders and we want them to be confident. You know, a lot of times a team of people will be looking up at the team of the leaders and saying, do they have a solid sense of direction? Do they know where they're taking us? And we put our confidence in the direction of our leaders. So we want to make sure they're aligned together. They've got their act together. And we want that of a single leader, too. We want that leader who might be leading me and the team to know what they're doing. And we want to have confidence in them. We place our confidence in a leader. In fact, when loss of confidence is the most primary reason that a leader would get fired is that we no longer have confidence in the leader, right? So we want confidence in a leader. And it, it's very important. But there is a place at which that confidence can go over a certain threshold into overconfidence. And in fact, the word hubris, the most simplistic definition of the word hubris is dangerous overconfidence. You know, colloquially, you and I might say a leader going over their skis, where their confidence gets so far that they're now ready for a wipeout because they're not paying attention to the fact that they know less than they think that they do. So overconfidence is very dangerous. We want a leader who's confident, but we don't want a leader who is cocky. And there is that threshold. I, I would also say this, Aiden, is what we really want in a leader is this magnificent blend, this balance between confidence and humility. We want the leader to be confident, but we want them to also never lose sight of their roots. We want them to have a strong sense of direction, but they, we also want them to ask for our input and to value our ideas. So we want confidence, but we also want a leader who has reasonability and humility and can listen to us, solicit our ideas, help us to become better people not just be fixated on themselves. Bill, there's a very blunt and straightforward message that you and John emit from the book to help us all ensure that we are in charge of our ego and it's not the other way around. I'd love if you'd share this. I'm happy to share it. And I need to warn you and your listeners that it's, it's a little on the harsh side. John and I were very deliberate and we were really thoughtful about this. And we went back and forth, should we include this message? But we feel that it's really important for the reader to hear it, for the listener to hear it. Uh, and that is, you know, no matter how much you climb up the ladder, no, much, no matter how smart you are, no matter how many skills you acquire along the way, no matter how much loyalty you have, from the people that are you're now leading, that you need to always remember, in order to stay humble, you need to remember that in the grand scheme of things, you ain't shit. You ain't shit. <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, we, we, none of us really are. We, we hey, it's so fine. It's fine. We want you to have a sense of self worth. That by all means, we should all have that. But we shouldn't start to think that we're above everybody else. And in the grand scheme of life that goes on in our absence, you know, at some point, we're just going to be a skull in the dust, right? And uh, just like every other person that's ever lived in humanity, we will be forgotten someday. So don't get so over yourself that you think that you are up above this and that somehow you are m immortal compared to everybody else. You ain't shit. So what's interesting, Aiden, I... Uh, gave the book to Ken Blanchard, the guy who wrote The One Minute Manager and 70 yeah, other great, great books, right? And uh, he's, a, he's a really good guy and a bit of, fr of a friend of mine. And he read it and, uh, and he sent me an email and he said, you know, Bill, you really don't let the reader off the hook. And he really liked the book, right? <laughs> he's like, you don't let the reader off the hook. And he said, at the end, he, he just said, and thanks for reminding me, I ain't shit. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. And I know that saying may sound crude and for, for some of us, but I'd, I, I thought about it and I actually went, you know what, this 
COVID lockdown we're all experiencing also gives us an opportunity to disconnect from that persona we have, the work persona, because yeah. what it makes us realize is all the stress we allow into our lives from our work and from our our over reliance of our purpose coming from work, that ain't shit because it really doesn't matter. And you mentioned before right. you can, can see what legacy you left by how many people are at your funeral or how many friends you are or how connected you are with other human beings. That's the stuff to be important. That's the stuff that's important yeah. and the stuff that we should be concerned about. And and maybe that's a bit of the silver lining of this COVID pandemic moment is that we're starting to recognize the things that are really important versus the things that seem important, the illusion or the imposter of importance. Uh, one of the things this probably has happened to you too. I, I know Zoom, for example, has become wildly popular in this time. Um, and then there's other technology, Teams and Skype and you know, Google Hangouts. But I remember when this first happened in the first week here in the United States, um, I was asked to be on a Zoom meeting where 65 other people were. And what was so cathartic about it was just seeing regular folks, not in their business clothes. Some people would have a dog in their lap or a four-year-old kid in their lap, and you could see their homes in the background. All of us just doing our best to carry on and and carry our vulnerability in this moment and be afraid together. And there was something quite meaningful and beautiful about that. And it had nothing to do with status and stature. Yeah, I love that. And it's the idea of just removing that mask and being who the authentic person is beneath the mask. But I thought a nice way to finish would be a few of the lessons we can take out of this and where we can work on ourselves. And one of them is a huge one where many of us don't understand really what a mentor does. And a mentor is one thing, but what you recommend and John recommends is that we all have an accountability partner or a truth teller, or as the Navy calls it, a swim buddy that can check us if our ego starts to get out of control or when we need somebody who is above reproach, who can call us out to make sure we don't run away with ourselves. Yeah, I call it a chief ego a deflator, <laughs> a chief ego deflator. You know, we need somebody around us who can be a check and that, that we entrust so much and that we value so much that we give them, entrust them with giving us the truth, the raw truth that everybody else is too afraid to give us and that we should value that truth. And I'll give you a quick story, Aiden. My wife, uh, she, I remember one day I was coming home for an event where I had a speaking engagement and I, and I was in training, uh, training and development magazine. It's like the industry trade rag. Right. And I was on page eight, my picture was there and I was looking at the magazine and I was downstairs and then I went back to page 21 and my picture was there again because I was speaking at two conferences. So now my head is huge and I go upstairs <laughs> to brag to my wife. I walked up like a big peacock and I said, look, honey, I'm on page eight. Uh, hey, hey, I'm not done yet. Look at page 21. And my wife looked at me with the universal look of spousal disgust and said these five words. And Aiden, I'm not kidding. These are literally the five words. She, she said, go clip your nose hairs. <laughs> you know she she knew i was getting over myself she was not going to let stand there and let me inflate my ego in front of her now we all need somebody like that and and let me be candid i love my wife and she also is the one that helps build me up when i'm too harsh on myself so she knows how to inflate me and deflate me um, and we need somebody like that who can call BS when we're, when we're starting to get over ourselves. So we all need a check or a chief ego deflator. <laughs> yeah, I love that one. And in the bonus section of the book, you give 10 tips for thriving leadership. And we won't have time to cover them all. But how about a couple of them, which we all need to heed whether we're leaders or not. And this is why I picked these two in particular, because you don't need to be leading a team of people to get huge benefit from these two. So the first one I picked out was number one on the list, which is to lead yourself first. And the second one then is number three on the list, which is partly linked to what you talked about, the lady from The Devil Wears Prada, that movie, where we name our fear because hubris feeds on fear. Right. And they're really related concepts. The, the first is self-awareness. It's an obligation of leadership to be self-aware. You need to know what you're good at, what you're 
appetites are. You need to know where your temptations are. You need to know yourself. Why would you be entrusted to lead anybody else if you were oblivious to yourself? So you can't afford, it's a dereliction of leadership duty to be self-oblivious. And, you know, that can be painful. The journey through yourself, the self-exploration. Uh, Gandhi said the truth only hurts if it should. And sometimes the truth needs to sting a little bit through self-awareness. Um, one way that a leader can do this is to go through a 360-degree feedback process where they get enlightened as to how people around them think about their leadership. I mean, you can ask a leader, are you a good leader? They might say yes, but that's not the viewpoint that matters. The viewpoint that matters are the people being led. What do they think about the leader? So saying self-aware is important. And part of self-awareness is to understand what you are drawn to, things, that, the passions that you have, and the fears that you have. As you rightly pointed out, Miranda Priestley in The Devil Wears Prada is transmitting her own fears. It comes out as wanting to control everyone and everything. Um, and so a leader needs to identify what is my fear. For some people, it's I fear that I'm not enough, for example. For another person, it might be fearful that other people are going to take me down. Whatever it is, it's important to understand what that fear is because that really is related to your dark, dark wolf. And you need to understand the full dimension of your personality and your attributes, the good, the good part and the shadow part, as you said, the Carl Jung part the shadow side. You need to befriend and familiarize yourself with your shadow and your sunshine. Lovely way to finish as well, Bill. Where can people find out more about you, your work, etc.? Great. Well, Aidan, my pleasure uh, to be able to connect with you. And a fellow Irishman, I've got a lot of Irish in my blood. Uh, <laughs> I got some Torpies and Gaynors and Nolans on my side, different side of McCormick's on one side of the family. They can find me at BillTreasurer.com. That's just like the treasurer of a bank, BillTreasurer.com, or CourageBuilding.com, or GiantLeapConsulting.com, and they can find the book at any online provider for sure. Author of The Leadership Killer, Reclaiming Humility in an Age of Arrogance, Bill Treasurer, thank you for joining us. My pleasure.